Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I almost feel that the greetings should not be interrupted <laughs> and that we should just keep on and on and on. It's so good to welcome you all to this building. We are the church meeting in this building. So it's so good to have you back in this house that is for the Lord as we are. Um, we're going to read our Psalms together again today responsibly. Okay, so if you would like to stand, please. God is our refuge and strength. All we is so we will not fear when the earth quakes. Let the oceans roar and fall. But the mountains tremble in the water stream. A river brings joy to the city of our God. The sacred home of the Lord's heart. God dwells in that city. It cannot be destroyed. The nations are in chaos. Their kingdoms crumble. God's voice thunders. And the earth melts. The Lord of heaven's armies is here among us. The God is our fortress. Come, see the glorious works of the Lord. See how he brings destruction upon the world. He causes words to end throughout the earth. He breaks the bow, he snaps the spear, he burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. Together now. The Lord of heaven's armies is here amongst us. Hallelujah. God of Israel is our fortress. Now to the doxology. Let's go. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below, praise him above ye heavenly hosts, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I Amen. I don't know if we know this song, but we want to learn a new song today. It says, leaning on the everlasting arms. It means a lot to me. And I want us to think through the words. You see, we're not putting up a performance here. And that's why someone like me can lead a song. <laughs> so just um, be encouraged by my own voice and sing through your heart to the Lord. It's all about God and about what you want to say to him. He says, um, do you want to help me then? <laughs> what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting earth. What a sadness, what a peace is mine leaning on the everlasting Stand up, are you leaving me? Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Leaning, 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 leaning on the ever stay. Second verse. Oh, how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way, leaning on the everlasting earth. 
Oh, how bright the path grows from day to day, leading me on the everlasting and cleaning me. Leaning, leaning, safe and secure from all. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What? How I to fear leaning on the everlasting earth. I have blessed peace with my not so near leaning on the everlasting. Give it a clap now. Leaning, leaning, leaning. From all me, 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 on the answer. Me, again. Me, 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 safe and secure from all. Leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. I've got peace like a river, peace like a river. I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace. Like a river, peace like a river, peace like a river in my I've got love like an ocean, love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul, I've got love like an ocean. Love like an ocean, I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got joy, I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain, joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, joy like a fountain. Joy like a fountain in my soul. I want us to do a little exercise now. Look those through those three. Peace, love, joy. Which one are you most in need of this morning? And then we will sing. Just pick one first. I've got peace. I've got love. I've got joy. Just pick one. And then we'll all sing it together. I've got peace, like sing your own peace, joy in my soul. I've got love like an ocean, joy like a fountain in my soul. Let's bow our heads to and talk to the Lord, tell the Lord. Joy, peace, love, which one is it? Just talk to the Lord about yourself this morning. Amen. Let us pray. Oh God, your word is near on our lips and in our hearts, just as your peace, joy, and love are also near. In this moment, you come to us not as fire, storm, or quaking ground, but as the intimacy of our very breath, the sound of sheer silence. Be present 
in our places of fear. Speak stillness to our trembling hearts. Minister to us with bread and water and rest. Then send us from that rest to be present with all who long for the beautiful promise of your good news and the serenity of your steadfast love and joy and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. All right, uh, membership classes continue this morning. Um, uh, I guess it's this afternoon, right after worship service. Uh, I hear there's been some good attendance uh, there. So uh, those of you who uh, uh, are have been going to that, it's at Zach's house, you know where it is. Those of you who haven't been going to it, again, this is not a commitment to say, I am going to be a member. Um, this can be just a learning experience, an exploration. Even if you haven't been to any of them yet, you may still go. Again, right after worship, two doors down, 33 South Garland. That would be where Pastor Zach and his family live. And that's where uh, the membership classes are being hosted if you are interested in just learning. Wednesday Bible study. Uh uh, we've kind of gotten away with this announcement, and and so we're bringing it back just as a reminder. <laughs> these these slides just disappear like that, you know, and then they never come back. Uh, this one came back. <laughs> um, uh, so it's an hour from six thirty to seven thirty, uh, and uh, so this Wednesday will be um, uh, uh, some sort of uh, I don't know what schedule we're on right now. We're in Galatians. You're in, in Galatians. All right. Um, uh, so yeah, come and join some, uh, fellow, uh, uh, Bible searchers, Bible studiers, uh, just right back there in that room. Fridays, as always, um, we have, uh, a need for volunteers as we have, uh, lots of people showing up. Um, so feel free if you wish to, uh, vo volunteer and helping with our, especially our clothing area, um, processing them. Um, you can start showing up at 1030. Uh, 130, we start shutting down. So anywhere in between, you can show up. In addition, if you prefer a less chaotic environment and you want to help, uh, we have two other processing days, clothing processing days, which, okay, it means hanging up clothes. That's all it means. Um, Tuesdays, starting at four, um, usually a couple hours, maybe not even that, depending on uh, how many people show up. And then Wednesdays, 10 a.m., uh, probably a couple hours. So those are a little less chaotic. Uh, you might find those times uh, better fitting to what uh, your needs are, but we do need help processing clothes. We um, get lots of donations and it's not that we're getting too many uh, because the need has increased. Just as the number of lunches have increased, you know, it used to be 150, 200, now it's 300 to 500. Also has the need for clothing. And, and so we just need to be able to process through those clothes a lot quicker. So feel free to show up. And speaking of the lunches, I believe they, uh, we do not have any lunches today to hand out. I don't know if there's any leftover breakfast or not downstairs, but um, yeah, so I, sorry. A lot of need out there. <clears throat> this is a save the date thing. You might think it's kind of early, but it'll be here before we know it. The first Sunday in December, December 3rd, we are having what we call a congregational council. It will be right after worship service and we'll provide a, a light lunch, but it'll be lunch. And uh, then we'll have some meeting time to discern um, God's direction for the church for this upcoming year, next year. Um, everyone is invited to attend this meeting. Now only the members will be voting um, but and if you're not sure if you're a member, we'll help we'll help straighten that out during the council meeting. <laughs> but everyone can attend to learn about what's coming up um, and um, as well as give input. Uh, so that's just kind of a save the date first Sunday in December. Uh, 
the second Sunday in December, we are doing a community Christmas brunch, um, inviting uh, uh, lots of kids. We'll have food. Uh, we'll be giving gifts to, away to kids, um, blessing our neighbors in Jesus' name. I heard that there's a, a guy in a red suit that's supposed to show up um, with uh, with opportunity to take pictures with them. Some people like may like to take a picture with a guy in a red suit. I don't know. Um, so um, we are going to need help cooking, stuffing gift bags, setting up, serving, and things like that. So Sunday, December 10th, um, if you know now you can help, that's great. Uh, if not, keep it on your radar to try to keep that open. It'll be right after worship service. And we are inviting community uh, people to this. Uh, we're having a, a, a registration actually, so we know kind of what age kids are going to show up and things like that. Um, should be should be a good time, but we will need help. All right. We're now moving to our time of offering. Um, this is not where we pause and and say. All right, we need to collect to uh, meet our bills. But this is another part of worship. Um, God gives us what is good. And we, in turn, get to give generously as we are able so that we might share God's good gifts to others and, and proclaim the good news. And so this is an opportunity where you are able to give Whatever it is you have to give, it might be financial resources, or maybe that's not what you have to give. It may be lifting up a prayer to God silently during this time, or maybe writing a, a prayer or praise on a card that's in the pew and placing that in the offering plate as offering up part of you. Of course, we can always offer up ourselves, our lives to God. Let us pray for the offerings we are about to receive. O oh God, as we bring our offerings, which are symbols of the power of this world, infuse in them the power of your world, the power of love. Through your blessing and our willingness to share, may these offerings become a source for hope and love in this church family and in the community beyond us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He 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 over volunteers. The guy's wonderful that way. <laughs> Um, I saw the light. Now, I don't know that I can lead this one. I can lead the chorus, and we can start with that. Now, do you guys know the chorus? Who else knows the chorus to this song? I saw the light. I saw the light. No more darkness. No more night. Now I'm so happy. No sorrow inside. Pray. The Lord. Dolores knows that I saw the light. All right. Now, my brother Steve is running to the front. <laughs> Steve, after that, they're, they're very much ready for someone that knows what they're doing a little better. <laughs> yes. I knew the chorus. Okay. Just a second. I got to get some help with my friend Hank Williams, but... Just a second. Um, um, sorry, guys. You did. You're okay. Okay. Uh, 
I wondered so aimless, life filled with sin. I wouldn't let my dear Savior in. Then Jesus came like a stranger in the night. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. Like a blind man, I wandered along. Worries and fears I claimed for my own. Then like the blind man, and God gave back his sight. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I was a fool to wander and stray. For straight is the gate and narrow the way. Now I have traded the wrong for the right. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the light. One more time. I saw the light, I saw the light. No more darkness, no more night. Now I'm so happy, no sorrow inside. Praise the Lord, I saw the lies. Good morning, church. If you're following Jesus, you're a priest and a king, priest and royalty, because you're his follower and adopted into his family. Be careful following Jesus, because if you have a willing heart, he's going to use you for the kingdom work. There aren't just like leaders in a church that are responsible for serving the neighborhood or wherever they are. If you follow Jesus, he'll use you. And if you have a willing heart, he'll use you a lot. So... I'm going to read us some scripture here, and may uh, the Lord bless us with it. The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them, and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. And they will not need to teach their neighbors, nor will they need to teach their relatives, saying, You should know the Lord, for everyone from the least to the greatest will know me already, says the Lord. And I will forgive their wickedness, and I will never again remember their sins. Amen. It is the Lord who provides the sun to light the day, and the moon and stars to light the night, and who stirs the sea into roaring waves. His name is the Lord of heaven's armies, and this is what he says. 
I am as likely to reject my people, Israel, as I am to abolish the laws of nature. This is what the Lord says. Just as the heavens cannot be measured and the foundations of the earth cannot be explored, so I will not consider casting them away for the evil that they have done. I, the Lord, have spoken. Am, amen. Um, we are continuing and drawing relatively um, uh, close to the end of the series that we'll be preaching on the Gospel of John. And we're in John 14. And the passage we're reading this morning is, oh boy, it's up there in, in terms of you know, a lot of people would maybe have this as a favorite passage. It's a very well-known passage. Um, it's a much commented upon passage, in, 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 you know, among academics. So whether you're, 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 you know, wanting to do some heavy thinking or whether it's devotional reading, I mean, this is just a passage that has sung in the hearts of Christians ever since it was first penned, you know, two, almost 2000 years ago. And, um, and all we can do, even with just 11 verses, is, is skim across the surface of these 11 verses. They're so wonderful, and there's so many ways into thinking about them. Um, and, and so we, we, will not, we will not exhaust the, the riches that are here in these 11 verses this morning. But I'm, I'm praying that God will use what I'm going to share with you to speak an eternal word into your heart that he'll take these temporary words and turn them into something eternal inside of you. Um, so let's, let's just dive in. I'm going to read uh, all 11 of the first, the first 11 verses of John 14. Remember that this is happening at the last supper, what we call the last supper, right? It's, it's, uh, it's Passover time. It's, um, it's all it, it's that night Jesus is going to be arrested he's going to be beaten he is going uh, to be falsely accused he's going to be condemned he's going to be uh, taken the early the next morning out and crucified and he sees all that coming he, he's trying to prepare his disciples for that he's said he's deeply troubled we this was last week's sermon he's deeply troubled in his spirit at the betrayal he's going to face. And it's actually the third time he said he's deeply troubled in the gospel. And then he begins, as we noted at the end of last sermon, he begins after talking about all the trouble he's facing with a command to us. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my father's house. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. And you know the way to the place that I am going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you are going. How can we know the way? <laughs> Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. If you had really known me, you would know my father, who my father is. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and we'll be satisfied. Do you catch that these disciples like us are not quick studies, right? That we, we keep messing up and keep getting things wrong. He tells us and then we immediately don't get it and he has to help us again. So, so Jesus replied to Philip, have I been with you all this time, Philip? And yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? Don't you believe? that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words I speak here are not my own, but my Father who lives in me does his work through me. 
just believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe because of the work you have seen me do. Amen. Lord, guide our thoughts as we examine this scripture. I'm going to use as our way into this scripture, or many ways in, and there are many moments in the scripture that could be the focal point of this sermon, but I'm going to use as our way in this well-known saying of Jesus, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, we could focus on the comfort at the beginning of that passage. We could, there's a lot, but I, I'm going to focus on, on, on Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. When you get to know him, when you get to know Jesus, you are getting to know the way you're meant to walk in this life. This is a fundamental need of us human beings. You know, um, an oak tree, you plant the seed, it grows, and it could grow crooked, it could fail to grow. But there, an oak tree doesn't have a question about what it means to be an oak tree. It's just, it's an oak tree. Um you know, and a dog doesn't have a kind of existential crisis about what does it mean to be a dog and how ought I to live? It sort of comes pretty much baked in. We human beings have a few very basic sort of things baked in, but the range of the sort of creature that you or I can become is incredibly remarkable. Human beings are capable of becoming monsters. We are capable of such horrible evil, of living in such terribly twisted ways um, that it just, it, it can be shocking. And we're capable of living in such startlingly beautiful, selfless and surprising ways, ways that defy even the, the basics of biological uh, sort of imperatives, right? That instead of seeking self-preservation, we might give our life away for somebody. Instead of, of holding on to that last crest, last crest of bread, we might gift it to someone else that needs it more. The human beings can live in defiance of what seem like their, their laws of nature, that, that, well, nature is red and tooth and claw, that we have to, it's the survival of the fittest, and we have to fight for our space, and we have to compete and win. And some people do that, and other people live a totally different way. What sort of a creature is a human being? How are we meant to walk? What is it to live a good life? My goodness, it, it turns out that we don't come knowing that naturally. We come with great confusion about that. And we argue with one another and we fight with one another about it. And religions and philosophies have risen and fall to answer that question. And we Christians, we have come to know and we have come to confess that there is somewhere you can look to learn how you're meant to walk in this life. You're meant to look to a person to Jesus Christ, who is the way we're meant to walk. And when you get to know Jesus, not only are you learning the way you're meant to walk, and we'll talk about what each of these things mean more particularly, um, but, but let, let me lay them out for us here with, in more detail first. You're also, when you get to know Jesus, learning the deepest truth of things. We have questions about how we're meant to live in the world. We also have questions about what is this world? Where are we? And what kind of a place is the universe, right? Is it a place? Is, is nature really red and tooth and claw? Is it a cruel place? Is it a place where the strong always prevail over the weak? Is it a place that cares about us? Is there is there a mind behind the universe that's looking out for us? Or is it the, all the product of random chance? Is it is it a chain of causation going all the way back into a bunch of nothingness and it will return to nothingness and the universe will suffer a heat death and there will be nothing forever and ever as there was nothing forever and ever? Is that true? Some people think it is in despair, right? What do we say? What do we, what have we come to know in coming to know Jesus about the universe? We've come to know that this universe was made by, through, and for this person, Jesus Christ. It reflects the logic, the logos of God. And if you want to know what the true nature of all reality is, if you boil it down, you need to get to know this person, Jesus Christ. So Jesus, when you get to know him, you learn how you're meant to live, you're, you're, the way you're meant to walk, you learn the deepest truth of all things, and you learn, learn about the source and the meaning of life itself. Who are you? Who are you? 
you know, I don't know that there's ever been a culture as obsessed with the question of identity as all our culture is currently obsessed. We're all seemingly constantly having an identity crisis and we argue about our identities and we set our identities against one another. And in all of the talk of identity, often the talk about identity always boils down to things that are sort of traits that are true about us externally. What's your racial identity? What's, uh, what's your sexual identity? Uh, what's your cultural identity? What's your national identity? Right? These are all traits about me. I'm born in a particular country. I have certain predilections. I, uh, I, I come from a certain uh, genomic stock or I look a certain way or I have a certain cultural background or I like certain things, right? People can try to build identities off of like cultural consumption. You know, my whole identity is that I'm really into X, Y, Z kind of music, or my identity is that I'm really into this sort of thing or that sort of thing. And, and, um, and so we're, we're, we're sort of always desperate trying to figure out who am I, who am I, who am I? And we keep trying to answer that with these traits. Well, who I really am is, is this thing that's true of me or this thing that's true of me or this thing that's true of me. And then of course, if who I am at my deepest level are these traits that are true of me, well, how am I supposed to relate to people over here who have different traits that don't, they're not like me. And then we end up hating one another. The people that aren't like me, that don't share those traits with me. So is who you really are something that can be read off of these traits about yourself? Or here's what scripture is telling us. Here's what Jesus invites us to discover is who you really are is somebody made in the image of the image of God. Your identity is, this is a quote from Paul, hid with God in Christ. In getting to know Jesus, you are getting to know the source and the meaning of your own life. If you want to know who you are, you need to look to Jesus to learn that. Behold, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't have an identity that's like this own bobble and here's a set of facts about me. I find myself in him. And, and, and so brothers and sisters, I mean, we human beings, these are things we need to know. We need to know how am I to walk in the world? What kind of world is this in that I'm walking in anyway? And who am I in that world? What is the source and the seat and the center of my self? And Jesus says, I am those things. To know these things, you have to get to know this person. To know the way to walk, the deepest truth about this world, and the source and meaning of your own life, you need to know a particular human being named Jesus Christ. Now, that is a remarkable thing if you think about it. To say that the way you ought to live and the deepest truth about the universe and the source and meaning of your own life is a person. What does that mean to say that? Because that's kind of a strange thing to say that the way I'm supposed to live is this guy right here. His name is Jesus. What does that mean to say that? What to make that claim? I think that's a question worth asking. And, and that's what we're going to explore here now. Because getting to know a person is very different from getting to know a philosophy or even a theology. Getting to know a person is very different um, from uh, getting to know facts about a person, right? The process of really knowing someone is very different than a process of, of, for instance, reading about them and learning about them, right? How do you get to know a person? And I would suggest that it involves a few things, but at least that it involves three, and we're going to talk about this. If you're going to really know someone deeply, you need to get to know the practices, the crafts, the habits that kind of make them who they are. What, 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 what are the characteristic activities they're involved in? You can tell a lot about a person by what they spend their time doing. And then you really get to know someone when you do those things with them. If I really want to get to know somebody, let me join them in doing what they characteristically do. Secondly, I think that we get to know people when we get to know their stories and share in their stories. Do I really know you if I've never heard about how you were brought up 
about the major moments and people that made you who you are, that you care about deeply. I need to know your story and I need to become a part of that story. I need to share a story with you. And and finally, if I'm going to get to know a person, I've got to talk with you. I've got to converse with you, right? Like I, may, maybe I really would love um, to say that I know Miles Davis, the great jazz uh, musician. You know, I could engage I couldn't really uh, because I'm terrible at music, but I could try to learn, you know, jazz and, and learn to play music. And if I did, I really would gain insight into him. Like somebody who's a master of a craft, I'm going to learn a lot about them if I do engage in that craft. Because I'm going to I'm going to gain insights into, into the world itself. I'm going to be able to see through their eyes a little better if I engage in what they engaged in. Um, so I, I could learn a good bit about Miles if I if I took up jazz myself. And, and I could read lots of biographies about Miles, right? But even if I did that, even if I became a skilled jazz musician, and even if I read a lot of biographies about Miles and knew all kinds of facts about him, could I say that I know Miles Davis? No, I, I could not say that. To know Miles... I would have to be a contemporary of his. He'd have to be alive. And he and I would have to be able to have a conversation together and get to know one another and spend time together if I were really to know him. It requires we be contemporaries and that we talk with each other. To know a person, it requires these three things, at least that we engage with them in the activities that are characteristic of them, that we learn to uh, know their story and share their story, and that we be present with them and converse with them. I think to know a person, we need to be doing those three things. And so then let's think about those three things in conversation with what Jesus told us about being the way, the truth, and the life. The way you are meant to live in this world is not a method that you can perfect the way is a person named Jesus. And you know him and become like him by practicing redemption craft with him, by joining him on the road and on the way, by becoming alongside him an under shepherd, becoming under him an ambassador of reconciliation, by joining him in his work. I want to talk to you about the difference between trying to learn a method and learning a way, a way of life. Has anybody, uh, you may have heard of this guy before, this guy with the name of uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor. He was, uh, wrote a book in 1911, The Scientific Principles of Management. And he wanted to figure out what is the most efficient way possible to mechanically produce goods. And uh, he realized you had to take complex tasks and break them down into as small a pieces as possible. And each person then would be given one teeny part of that process. So for instance, if you're going to make shoes, rather than having a master cobbler who's learned his trade and knows everything about how to make those shoes um, and, and, uh, and, and learns that trade kind of uh, by heart, so to speak, you create an assembly line. And the first person in the assembly line uh, pulls a machine lever that slices out a, a, a pattern. And it's one pattern. It's just one. And the next person puts that piece that got cut out on a, on a forming machine and they pull a lever and it forms it and they have one of five sizes. And the next person pulls a lever on a machine that drives a nail into it. And boy, you can create a shoe in, in uh, well, maybe two minutes where it would take a cobbler, you know, the better part of a day to finish one. Really, really efficient. This is a method for making a shoe. The goal of the method is actually to take skill and intimate internalized knowledge out of it. Each person just pulls a lever and you can mass produce the shoes. But what happens if one of the machines breaks? Does anybody on that assembly line know by looking and touching the leather with their fingertips, ah, uh, this leather is fit for a shoe? No, it's not. Or look at the grain of this leather. I know because I've done it so many times that the grain of this leather will break unless you treat it this way. The only way you would learn that is through apprenticeship to a master who has so deeply come to know every part of his craft or her craft that they know the feel and the scent of the leather and the nails that are used. 
the yarn and the laces that they know all of that and they know it innately. They know it in their bones. They know it in their fingertips. And so if something goes wrong with a particular shoe, they know exactly how to respond. Not because there's a method that Frederick Taylor wrote them and says, pull lever A, then lever B, then lever C and just do it. And if it breaks down, I'm sorry, but you're not going to know what you need to know. No, what you need is to be apprenticed to a master that knows and to spend years in, the, in that apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is not done quickly because you're learning a craft. You're learning a way. You're not just a cog in a machine. Jesus does not invite us to be cogs in a machine. He does not invite us to pull a single lever. He invites us to be disciples, to learn a discipline from him, a way of life, a craft, the craft of living in tune with God, the craft of praising him, of representing him, of serving him, the craft of ministering grace. Jesus invites us to walk with him over the course of years. He spent three years with his disciples and they were still pretty confused after three years. They had to go through some stuff to learn it. Well, it's going to take your whole life to learn the craft of living to the glory of God. And the longer you go, the deeper your knowledge will become of him as your way. You're not learning a method from him. Okay, Jesus, what's the method? Write it down. Then I don't need you anymore, right? If Jesus was teaching a method, we could do away with him. I don't need Jesus anymore because he taught me the eight steps and then I just follow my eight steps. He doesn't give that to you. He says, I'm the way. Follow me. Learn from me. Watch me. Here, bend over with me as we rub the, this plane against the grain of this wood. Put your hand on the plane with me. Now, I want you to feel. Do you feel that? There's an unexposed knot in the wood there. Do you feel Do You feel it? You have to learn the feel for living from Jesus by having his hand on your hand, by walking with him one step of the way. We always want shortcuts. We always want the, well, tell me what the five steps are. Tell me what the six steps are. Give me the method so I can do it on my own. And Jesus says, there, no, sorry. There is no method. I want better than that for you. Because your life is going to throw you lots of curveballs. The enemy is going to attack you and you need to be ready. And the only way you're going to be ready is if you're with me and learning from me. Because the cobbler, the master carpenter, the people that have learned from them, they have the ability to respond with creative ingenuity on the fly when problems are presented because they know the whole craft. They're not just a cog in the machine. They're not just beholden to a set of steps. So don't settle for a set of steps or people that sell you a Christianity that's a set of steps. Settle for nothing less than Jesus Christ, the living master who is the way we are meant to walk. So Jesus is the way we get to know him by joining him in these redemption crafts. Uh, and there are many of them. We could, boy, you could preach a whole sermon series on what are the crafts of discipleship. Uh, we won't do that now. I won't belabor that point now, but that would be a cool thing to get into maybe sometime. Okay, but Jesus is the way. So then let's think about the truth. Is the truth an axiom, a proposition, or a set of them that we can memorize? No, the truth is a person. His name is Jesus. And I know him by learning his story and sharing in that story with him and sharing that story with others. You know, sometimes we treat the Bible as if the point of the Bible was to give us a systematic theology. And we extract the systematic theology from the Bible. And it's like, yeah, this is the point of the Bible. Here it is, the systematic theology. And, uh, and then we argue about that with one another. Uh, do you know there, there are new systematic theologies written every year, and it turns out none of them are exactly the same. <laughs> and in fact, some of them are radically different from one another, and we still keep writing them. And that's not bad. I happen to enjoy reading systematic theologies, so I'm not, I'm not saying they're worthless. But what I'm saying is the point of the Bible is not to give you a systematic theology. If God wanted to give us a systematic theology, axiom one about God, axiom two, here's the, how they fit together. If he wanted us to have that, that's what we, he would have given us. But that isn't what he gave us. He gave us Jesus and he gave us the book that tells us about Jesus. He gave us the Logos and he gave us the Logoi, the words that tell us about the word of God. Most of the Bible is narrative and poetry. Some of it is bewildering and confusing and you scratch your head and like, well, well what was the point of that story? <laughs> and you have to pour yourself in. You must seek him with all your heart, he says, if you're going to find him. That's in Jeremiah. 
You have to invest yourself in the story. You have to try to put yourself in front of it and inside of it. You have to walk with others in it. And if I'm going to get to know the truth about this world, I, I don't need a system of axioms and propositions. I need to know this man, this Jesus. Know him the way I would know my best friend or even better. His moods and his character. How he characteristically responds. What is? How does Jesus respond to needy people? Right? What kind of a person is he in, in the way that he relates to the needy or to the forgotten or to the powerful, to the unjust? You need to be in the Gospels. You need to be reading them and rereading them and rereading them. And you need to be in the Old Testament, which foretold him and points in advance to him and, and the, which is interpreted in the light of those gospels, sort of that light shedding backwards and revealing what was always true in the scriptures. And, and, and we need to know his story. This is his story from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 21. This is his story. We need to know that story and we need to know that his story isn't over. It didn't end. You and I are part of his story. The book of Acts could have many tens of thousands more chapters than are in it, right? We're somewhere in that story. And it's sometimes neat to think about like, what would it look like if I were writing a letter to the church of God in Dayton, Ohio, the way Paul writes to the church of God in Laodicea? Or what would it look like if, if, uh, if Luke were to come and, and write out what Jesus was up to on the east side of Dayton today? You and I are part of his story. It's a story we need to know. There is no substitute, brothers and sisters, for knowing the story of, of Jesus as it is related in the Bible. There certainly are doctrinal passages of Scripture, and there are law passages of Scripture, but we make the same mistake the Pharisees made when we think that, okay, if I memorize the 613 laws that are in the Torah, then I've done what God wanted me to do, and I can keep those, and that's the point. They knew all the laws. They searched the Scriptures diligently, thinking that in them they had eternal life, but Jesus said to them in John 5, you do all that, you search them so diligently, thinking you have eternal life, but you fail to recognize the one whom they were written to point to. I'm right here and you don't even know who I am. You missed the point of scripture because the point of scripture is me, Jesus is saying, to help you know me and love me and follow me. And so brothers and sisters, there is no substitute for that. We need to be reading and reading with great care and attention and patience and love the story of our savior as it is written authoritatively and trustworthily in scripture. Many people tell stories about Jesus in the world around us today, and some are true and some are false. How will you judge who Jesus really is from who he is not, unless you go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, unless you go back to Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, unless you let John 1 teach you that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then you read Genesis 1, 1 and hear about the spirit of God hovering over the waters. And he said, let there be light. God spoke a word and creation responded with existence. And if you read Genesis 1 in the light of John 1, then you're beginning to learn the story of this world and of your own life as the story of Jesus Christ whom we are called to know as the deepest truth about all things. And when you learn that story, you learn what kind of world we're in. I taught an introduction to theology class at the University of Dayton uh, for half a dozen or so years. And I would always have my students read um, the Genesis creation account side by side with um, a account of the creation that came from an ancient Babylonian culture, uh, uh, the, from the Epic of uh, Gilgamesh. And, um, and uh, uh, well, there's a couple of passages I would have them read. But in this, I, I, I said, okay, what kind of a world do these two documents, Genesis, the Bible, and this document show us that the world is? And in the one document from the ancient Near East, there are master gods and slave gods. 
And the slave gods build the world and the world is like a giant industrial waste heap. They like dig the Euphrates river with toil and labor and it's awful and they hate it. And they build up the mountains and they're like, the mountains are like slag heaps. And the world just seems like this like vanity project of the master gods and the slave gods rebel and try to murder the master gods. And the slave gods get so angry. The master gods say, okay, fine, fine, fine. You won't have to do all the hard work. We'll make human beings to be the slaves of the slave gods and will set a drumbeat in their hearts so that they will know that it is their task to toil as slaves for us their whole life. What is the heartbeat in your, in your chest according to this ancient de- text? It is a slaver's drum telling you that's all you are. You're a slave. You're a slave. You're a slave until the day you die. And what is the world? It's the vanity project of, of rich master gods. It's not beautiful. It's not a web of creation. It's not like the only descriptions of the natural world are these two brief references to mountains and rivers and they're horrible things that people, the the slave gods die to make. And then I have them read Genesis. Tell me, what is the world according to Genesis? It's art. It's very good. It's love. It's a home for a web of life. And behold, there were creatures flying in the air above, and there were creatures in the waters below, and there were things that crawled on the land, and there were the things that walked on four feet. And and there's this, this attention to the beauty of nature. There was no concept even of nature as an object of beauty, as a work of art in this other culture. But according to the Bible, that's what the world is. It's beautiful, and it's a home, and it's a web of life, and it is a place where God has set his very image in the midst to care, to be a steward, not a slave, but to be a friend that walks with God in the cool of the evening. That's where we are. That's the world. And so, brothers and sisters, we get to know the truth about things when we get to know the story of Jesus when we read it in the Word. And lastly, finally, the life that you have is not ultimately about some set of traits, whatever they are, that really define you. Really, who I am is X, Y, Z thing that is true about me externally. Your life, our life, human life in general is found, its meaning is found, its purpose is found in Jesus Christ. All people are made in the image of God and Christ is the image of the invisible God. He is the capital I image. We were all made for him, through him, and by him. We are all loved by him. And I get to know myself, my life, and its purpose and meaning by conversing with him, right? That was the third thing I said we need if we're going to know somebody, we have to talk to them. Prayer is talking to God. Your maker, our maker, wants us to talk with him. In those very beginning chapters of the Bible, right, God is walking and talking with Adam and Eve. And he goes looking for them after they sin and says, where are you? And then he says, what have you done? He doesn't scream. He doesn't doesn't call down curses upon them. He does impose limitations upon them. Uh, He pronounces that a curse will follow upon their sin, but he tenderly cares for them under those cursed conditions. He covers their nakedness and he gives them hope from the very beginning in Genesis 3, 28, 28 or 23. In Genesis 3, at the end of the chapter, um, he says, behold, a child, a son of Eve, a seed from Eve, is going to get bitten on his heel by the serpent. But that son of Eve will crush the serpent's head. And from the beginning, Christian readers have said, see, from the beginning, even in the moment when everything went wrong, even at that moment, God said, I'm going to set it right. And a son of Eve will come. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who's a son of Eve, but is the son of God, will come and he will crush the source of evil and he will free us from its effects. God, from the beginning, was concerned for us. God wants to walk with us. He wants to talk with us. He wants to talk to you. You may think, what do I have to say to God? I don't know what to say. You might think, oh, God does not want to hear from me right now. I have screwed up. I've sinned. My heart is a mess. If I start talking to God, bad stuff's going to come out of me because I only got bad stuff in my heart right now. I am angry. I am bitter. I am, uh, I, 
I'm twisted up in X, Y, Z way. I can't talk to God. And God says, please talk to me. I think I've told the story at least once before from the pulpit, but it may have been a while. And I'll share this as we move toward closing. Ironically, I think one of the hardest seasons in my life, and I've certainly had an easier life than many, and I'm not pretending that this is particularly hard, but one of the harder seasons in my life was actually while I was in seminary. Um, I was working at 1.3 part-time jobs while going to school full-time. Um, I had no health care, and I had a, a kidney stone that was lodged and wouldn't come out, and I couldn't afford the surgery to get the kidney stone removed. So I would have horrible pain that would visit me at times, sometimes for hours as I lay on my floor. Um, didn't have any meds for that, so I would just lay on the ground. I'd, I'd be vomiting from the level of pain. Um, no, no way to get the surgery I needed. Um, I was in a relationship that was coming apart, um, uh, a romantic relationship, and um, didn't really have any friends. It was so busy. And um, and so I was lonely, and I was sick and in pain, and I was overly busy. Um, and I had no real relationship with the Lord, despite being in seminary. I had stopped praying. At one level, I was angry with God. At one level, I was avoiding him because I knew, for instance, that my relationship I mentioned was not healthy and he wanted me out of it. And I kept trying to cling to it and make it work. And, um, and so I just was not praying and uh, am feeling more angry and more bitter and more hopeless. And I recall being awoken one night with pain and um, being very angry with God. I think quite unfairly because <laughs> I had I'd made a lot, a mess, a lot of things on my own and, and other things would have been much more bearable if I had been living the way he wanted me to. Um, and some of the things were out of my control and just hard. But I, uh, in that moment where I was in pain and it was late at night, I, um, I did talk to God angrily. Uh, and I, I let God know in choice language. And I am not someone that has ever used, uh, very choice language. I, I, I just, they don't fall out of me. Even if I stub my toe, I, I say things like, Ooh, you know, uh, uh, curse words don't come to me naturally. Um, you know, I used him that night. I, I've, I don't know if I've ever felt quite the way I felt that night. And I, I was really angry with God and I, and I let him know that. And, um, and something really amazing happened. It literally took two minutes of me kind of yelling at God for the Holy Spirit to descend in an almost palpable way in this sense of God saying, I'm so glad you're talking to me again. So glad you're talking. Even if it was to yell at him. And then all it took was two minutes of, of yelling at him for me to be a puddle of tears and saying, I'm sorry, God, I'm sorry I was yelling at you. I'm sorry I wandered away from you. I'm sorry that I haven't listened to you about that relationship. I'm sorry. you know. And, uh, and the Father just pouring love onto my heart. And um, because he wanted me to talk with him. And, 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 and so um, I began praying again. And I began um, listening and, and trying to do what he was telling me to do. And wouldn't you know it at the time... Um, the uh, uh, ACA, the Obamacare Act, had just gone into effect and, and it had a provision where you could go back on your parents' insurance. And so I was able to go back on my parents' insurance and, and I got, a, I got a, a surgery that I desperately needed. And, um, and, 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 uh, and, I, and I ended that relationship with, with that girl who's a wonderful girl. We just weren't right for each other and we were trying to stick it out in a way that we shouldn't have. And, and things got much, much better. And I actually, my last year of seminary was still really hard, but it was so much better there were some practical reasons for that, but the, the big reason was I was walking with God and talking with him as I walked with him. And, and so I could bear the fact that I had no money and couldn't replace the car that had broken down and had to beg rides everywhere or ride the bus and had to scrounge change for that and 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 could could bear the fact. Like, I still had all these problems, but like I could bear them because I was walking and talking with God. Brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. You don't have a method. You have Jesus. 
You don't have a philosophy that answers every question. You have a Lord who walks with you through every season. Walks with me and talks with me. And you don't have some cobbled together identity of X, Y, Z traits that you happen to have. You have a best friend, a savior, a master, a Lord, and a redeemer. And he is your identity. Jesus Christ is who you really are. You were made for him and he died for you. That's what we have in Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And we are his disciples. That is who we are. He restores us when we fall. He helps us. He loves us. He's patient with us. He knows the best for us. And we get today to come to his table. This is his table set. He set it. He set it through the hands and the feet, the mouths and the efforts of various people in this church who baked bread or poured juice, set out the tablecloth or got ready for today. And he invites you to come to this table so that you will remember. That was the word he used. So you will remember him. You will remember how much he loves you that he died for you. That when you taste something on your tongue, that tangible thing will remind you of his tangible body that tangibly hurt for you. When you taste the sweetness of that cup, you'll remember the bitterness in his mouth while his blood came down his forehead and into his mouth. It was bitter for him, but it's sweet for you and I because he purchased for us a new life, an eternal life, forgiveness of sins and a new way to walk in the world. You are invited to come to this table, brothers and sisters, not because you're strong, not because you've perfected a method or memorized a theology or because you figured out who you really are. You're invited to come to this table to meet with your Savior and to let him remind you that he is your way, he is the truth, and he is the only life. I want to invite my sister, Pastor Susan, to come and Help us prepare via confession and examination for the reception of these elements. In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes these words. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. As we prepare to partake of the bread and the cup, let us first examine ourselves. Reflect on our reasons for thanksgiving, faith, repentance, and love. Let us take a moment of silence to remember the Christ who called us to break bread with one another. And during these silent moments, examine the state of our faithfulness. Let us be in quiet confession.
Oh Lord, we come to you this morning asking for your forgiveness. You know our thoughts. You know our feelings. And so for our shortcomings, Lord, please forgive us as we prepare to take the bread and the cup. Amen. Christ does not say, come to me, and from now on you will never feel pain again. Instead, he says, you are my body, and you too will be broken. For to be my body, you have to be broken. But come to me, and I will give you rest. The church, which is Christ's body on earth, that is us, has to be willing to break open to the poor, to the lonely, to those of different skin color and different convictions, to those in the midst of, and in the midst of all of this brokenness, Christ is always with us. Let us now symbolically gather at the Lord's table by partaking of the bread and the cup. As the song plays, that you'll hear shortly, you will come forward and take the bread and the cup, take it back with you and wait. And then at the appointed time, Zach will lead us in the partaking of the actual cup and bread.
So brothers and sisters, the reason we hold on to those things, we come up to get them, which is a powerful symbol that we come to a single table, but then we, we wait to eat them all at the same moment because that also communicates that we're a single body. So we get them from one table and then we have a single moment where we partake. And, and the way we partake is, is reading um, the words of Jesus as conveyed to us in the form that Paul gave them in, in the Corinthian correspondence. And so um, I'm going to read for you. Um, a piece of that uh, scripture, and then you'll respond with the, the bold words. And after we speak them, I'll invite you to partake, and we'll all partake together. And, and we're going to do the bread first. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, our Lord took some bread, and he gave thanks to God for it. And then he broke it, and he lifted up its pieces, and he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Please respond. Partake, remember, proclaim, and enjoy your Lord. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took a cup of wine, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people poured out in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Please respond. Partake and remember. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for the life that you have given us in Jesus Christ. We pray that you would help us to walk you as our way, to know you as the truth, and to live you as the life. May we stick close to you in every moment, hard and easy, joyful and sorrowful, reflect you in all things and grow closer to you every day. We want you to be glorified in our lives and in our life together as a church. We want you, Lord God, to unleash your glorious, wonderful, loving power through us into the world around us. We want to see, Lord God, your kingdom come. We want to see your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, Lord God, we have announced through this cup your death, waiting until you come again, when the kingdoms of this world really will be yours, fully at last, recognized by all as such. Bless each one here. I pray these things in your name, God. Amen. I was passed a note just uh, as we were together, and it's heavy on somebody's heart, and it may be more than one person. Uh, we're coming up on an election day, and uh, we don't go in for uh, politics here, but this person really wants us to be praying about the vote on um, uh, the abortion issue that's coming up. And so I invite us to pray about that, and we'll pray about that together. Whatever governments decide, in whatever 
wins on a voting day. You and I are called to be radically on the side of life, who is Jesus Christ. We are called to adopt, to care for, to advocate for the vulnerable and the weak, the, the children not yet born who are known in their wombs by God and precious to him, by mothers who are racked with grief, who don't know what to think, what to do in hard situations, we are called to a universal compassion. We're called to be on the side of life, everybody's life. Um, there are very messy situations in this world. We are called to bring kindness in life and hope to all of them, to let people know that death doesn't have to be the option, that violence doesn't have to be the option. And so if you are persuaded that a vote is important, go do that. Um, but whatever you do, Make yourself an advocate for life. Jesus is life and he's on the side of life. Let me, let me pray for us um, uh, in that regard. Heavenly Father, Lord, we don't put our trust in governments. We don't know what the outcome of that vote will be. But Lord God, we pray that you would bring peace to um, the many people in this country that regularly opt for violent ends to, to, to the lives of their children. That you would help those people that, that think that for whatever reason, that's the only viable option. And Lord God, that you would let there be paths out for people, for, for, for the children, for the mothers, that there would be care for young women in possible situations, that there would be um, resources garnered for them, there would be homes willing to take them in, there'd be places for them to go, there'd be people that would love them, that there would be places to receive and help the, the, the children, many, uh, many millions of which, Lord God, whose lives have been cut off early. We pray, Lord God, for something better than the politics of this country that is often offered that gets angry and that gets divided. May we not come with anger to this issue, but with a generous and endless and boundless compassion. And may it be a compassion that knows no bounds. May it be one that offers answers at the, at the cost of our own lives and our own homes, that doesn't have a platitude, that doesn't think that a vote is the end of the story, but that knows, Lord, that we are called to be a friend to widows and orphans, to the vulnerable, to the poor, to the desperate at whatever point in the journey of life they are. Lord God, human life matters to you in every station, in every situation. We pray your blessing would come into this particular nation through this embassy of your nation, the church. Make us a better people. Give us your love for all people and make us advocates and examples of the life of heaven on earth. We pray that in your name, amen. Brothers and sisters, um, it's been good to be together. And I give you at the end of this service, the blessing that uh, has been uh, a standard for us for a long time. It's the great high priestly blessing out of numbers. May the Lord God almighty bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face to you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his everlasting peace. Go forth in that peace, brothers and sisters. Amen. And if you are going to the membership class, that probably will start in about 10 minutes. So just be aware.
I'm not going to do that. 